So it's so nice to see so many people online and I see more people coming in as we actually starting the webinar. So welcome everybody. And I, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on Aboriginal land and recognize the strength, resilience and capacity of the traditional owners of this land. So as this is an emotional intelligence um, webinar, I thought that it might be quite a good idea for all of us to just take a couple of moments to reflect on how we're checking into the webinar. So just take a moment to notice what emotions are arising for you as you join us this morning. If you feel comfortable um, to share with us, it would be really great if you would post two emotions in the chat box and we can get some sort of idea of the emotional energy in the webinar this morning. I'm sorry, there's just still a few people with their um, microphones not on mute. If you could please mute your microphones, that would be great. Whilst you're checking in to see what emotions are coming up for you. So personally, I'm checking in this morning, very excited to be hosting this event and probably a little bit anxious as well at the same time. I would just like to start, first of all, um, by giving you a little bit of personal background. So I'm a counsellor, clinical supervisor and educator in the areas of counselling and psychology. I have a special interest in perinatal mental health, but I do offer counselling to individuals, couples and families. My um, research has been mainly in the area of perinatal mental health and the use of self-compassion. Most of the research has been around trying to find ways to help um, mothers cope with the emotional roller coaster of motherhood. And more recently, my research has been in perinatal mental health with regards to fathers and other primary caregivers. So in my work with clients, I'm actually, I'm really passionate about emotional intelligence and uh, I draw on several modalities when I'm working with clients, one of them being emotion-focused therapies, the other compassion-focused therapy, and then I draw on attachment theory. The reason I've chosen these sort of modalities is to try and help people increase their self-awareness and find ways to help clients sort of recognize, regulate, and express their emotions, as well as find the ability to self-soothe in times of emotional distress. When I'm working as a clinical supervisor, one of my main roles is to try and encourage other professionals to utilize the skills of emotional intelligence and basically draw on those skills to help prevent burnout and compassion fatigue, which we know is really prevalent, especially in the current world that we live in. Um, one of the other things I think is that um, for me, emotional intelligence, I believe is an essential skill to help alleviate mental health issues and provide a foundation for psychological well-being. So that's enough about me. Now to emotional intelligence. Okay, emotional intelligence can be defined as the ability of an individual to understand their own emotions and other people's emotions, and ultimately to make decisions using this emotional information during everyday life and in the workplace. We all know that the intensity of emotional distress people are experiencing has increased exponentially in the last year. We're unfortunately witnessing unprecedented levels of anxiety, depression, loneliness, isolation, substance abuse, suicide, and domestic violence. Emotional intelligence from research and from lived experience has been proven to increase the quality of interpersonal relationships. It decreases feelings of isolation and loneliness, and it aids in the prevention of burnout and compassion fatigue. We live in a world that encourages the suppression of emotions and giving people the ability to understand their emotions and recognize the emotional state of others is essential for their mental health, social connection, and life satisfaction. I'm so excited to be part of this society. I feel very privileged to be one of the members of the board, and I'm looking forward to increasing the awareness of emotional intelligence in Australia. Before I hand over to my other board members, I would just like to highlight for you the three key aims of our society. 
Firstly, to bring together researchers, scholars, professionals, and others who are interested in the principles of emotional intelligence and their application. To encourage and support the advancement of emotional intelligence, theory, research, and applied practice, and to disseminate emotional intelligence, theory, research, and empirical knowledge. My fellow board members will be expanding more on what we will be offering as a society. And it now gives me great pleasure to hand over to our chairperson, Associate Professor Chris Skinner. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Cindy. And um, you really do um, fit the BBC ABC uh, Chairman Award. And it's really great. It's really great to have you chair, chair the, this session. So thanks a lot for that. Um, can I also thank the, our executive team that's got the society together? And that's yourself, Cindy, Nigel, Laurel, and Annette. Um, it's been great having us get together and work through the establishment. I'd also like to thank uh, our ambassadors, um, Mark Spavel um, from Microsoft and Neil Ashkenazi from the University of Queensland. I've also got uh, greetings from John Pelletieri, the president um, of the overall International Society, but he's laid up in New York uh, with a fever and a chill, but it's also, I think, 11.30 or 10.30 in New York, so um, he sends his greetings from his bed, I think. Um, today's the start of ESA and the Emotional Intelligence Society of Australia and it really brings together, I think, a whole range for myself personally of some educational aspects, some leadership aspects, some clinical psych aspects, and more, recent, more recently for myself, the role of emotional intelligence in medical education. Just want to say a few words about the creation of our society. As uh, Nigel, who will be... Uh, talking in a minute, uh, said to me, we, the germination of the idea of the society stemmed from the New York 2013 International Society meeting that John Pelletieri, as the president, convened. The International Society every two years has an international conference and um, we can put a bid in for future conferences. In 2015, we put in a bid to have the conference in, in Fremantle in, for 2019. And we were actually awarded the conference in 2016. So run forward to July 2019, and we ran a two-day, three-day conference. We had over 150 pe people at the conference, and we had, the, had uh, people from 25 different countries at least. So from that time, really, um, July, which seems ages ago, really, pre-COVID, the group, the executive group has met and worked towards forming a society, ESA. And that's what we have today with its launch. So thanks again for, the, for that involvement. When we were designing this launch, we had to think about, well, we were talking about what creates the passion for emotional intelligence. And for me, I think the whole passion aspect of emotional intelligence really, really links to me because it can be seen in terms of my own self, can see, be seen in terms of interpersonal relationships, can be applied to organizations, has a wide scope, if you like. And also, as David Caruso said in one of his quotes, it's very important to understand that EI is not the opposite of intelligence. It is not the trumping of heart overhead. It is the unique interaction of both. So in a sense, that linking to the two aspects is led to the, the passion that I have for AI. My PhD was in empathy, empathy and leadership in health professionals. I surveyed over 100 health managers and looked at whether empathy and emotional intelligence was important for effectiveness in their leadership. And what I basically found was empathy and ER is important for leadership effectiveness. It's not as important for just pure transactional management, but for leadership, it's key. So move on a bit from my doctoral studies, and now I'm working and seeing the application of EI in medical education. And medical education is a complex beast, very heavily clinically orientated, 
with a lot of cognitive knowledge. So what we and a group of us at, at the University of Notre Dame have been trying to do is to integrate a little bit of EI into medicine, into medical education, through such things as clinical debriefing, even medical selection is increasingly EI has got a place in. There's issues to do with interpersonal communication. And quite critically, the whole doctor-patient relationship can be seen and encompassed by linking to EI. So it's exciting. Um, just moving on a little bit, and I will uh, just wanted to talk about future conferences. Well, every two years, the International Society, well, in this case, three years because of COVID, but every two years, there's an international uh, meeting by uh, next year, it will be in Sicily, in Italy. And in 2024, its aim is to be in Moscow. Every, uh, every year or so, some regional societies have conferences. There is a conference coming up, online conference out of Bulgaria, Sofia, on, uh, in the middle of June this year. And the society, our society, ESA, is also planning to have a national conference towards the end of November this year, and we'll let you know. So part of our role and part of the society's role is to network and give you information on these conferences. So really want to welcome everybody. And I'll hand over to um, the deputy chair. He's looking very august there, um, Nigel Gribble. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh... And I do remember meeting you for the first time. I always, I, I think it's delightful that when you live in the same city as someone, but you meet them in a place like New York. And I just remember you saying to me, uh, we need to do an Australian thing. And here we are eight years later, uh, launching the Emotional Intelligence Society of Australia. And uh, I am so super proud to be part of this organization, super proud to be part of the future of this organization. Uh, and I hope to uh, involve more and more and more Australians as well as people from uh, international locations. Can I just ask everyone who's online with us to type into the chat, where are you? Where are you joining us from? Which city, um, country, whatever? Love to know where you're from. Perth, 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 Frio. Gold Coast, Brisbane. I used to live in Brisbane. Sydney. I know Mark's in Seattle. Gladstone. Adelaide. Oh, that's fantastic. So we're look, already we're seeing, we're spreading the word across Australia. And uh, look, we, we have started in Perth, but we really, really want to involve everyone, every state, every um, um, and every human being across the planet. Um, I was listening to Mark Brackett. Uh, Mark Brackett uh, is the director of the Yale uh, Center for Emotional Intelligence uh, this morning. And uh, he was talking about the importance of uh, moving our society towards being uh, emotion scientists uh, rather than emotional judges. Um, emotional scientists are curious about people's emotions. They're going to you know, notice that somebody's um, not quite how they should be and ask how they are. They're not gonna make assumptions about their, their emotions and their feelings. They're going to um, ask and, and question and, and, and listen really intently. And I think these are some of the really basic skills of being, um, of, of having mature emotional intelligence skills. It's not making assumptions, it's about asking. It's not saying, how are you, as a flippant comment. It's a, it's a, how are you? And then stopping and pausing and genuinely listening to some of the really basic skills of the emotional uh, scientist. Um, my passion for emotional intelligence came, uh, st started, I'm an occupational therapist by trade. Uh, I worked in vocational re rehabilitation, uh, working, helping people with injuries and disabilities get, get into or back into the workforce. And it was working with people with distress and pain in vulnerable situations uh, whose future had been taken away from them that, that I had all the emotions laid bare on the table um, during interviews 
and during worksite visits almost on a daily basis. And I knew how important it was to, uh, to take into account others' emotions and my own emotions. But it was when I was doing my MBA in 2004 that um, uh, Rick Ladyshewski, who uh, supervised my PhD ultimately, mentioned the, the word emotional intelligence. And it's, it all just came pouring down and it's when that's the umbrella term I've been looking for. And so I've been fascinated by the topic ever since. I completed a PhD where I tracked the emotional intelligence of occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and um, uh, speech pathology students over the last 18 months of their course. And we identified that because of their immersion in field work placements, where they're working with patients in distress and in vulnerable situations, oh, their overall emotional intelligence tended to improve, but some aspects of their emotional intelligence also uh, dived. Um, and I'm doing further uh, research on, on that. I'm now really curious about uh, how training uh, can be, uh, um, training in emotional intelligence can help teams, uh, particularly healthcare teams. Uh, and uh, I'll be doing further research uh, on that. So one of the things I really want to talk to you about is uh, is the training, uh, the, the certification programs that the Emotional Intelligence Society of Australia uh, is about to commence uh, running. So we're going to run a level one, a level two and a level three certification program. Uh, these programs have been, were initially designed by John Pelletieri and his team, uh, who are part of the International Society of Emotional Intelligence. And uh, we've taken um, John's work and adapted it to the Australian uh, context, and we will um, run these courses over the next, um, yeah, well, hopefully forever. So the level one course, which is running for the first time on the 16th of July at the Tradewinds Hotel in Fremantle, uh, there are some details on our website, and you should be able to register uh, for that training in the next hopefully today. Um, and we'll cover what is emotional intelligence, the, the, the big conceptual models of emotional intelligence, the history of emotional intelligence, uh, the neuroscience of emotions and how we measure a person's emotional intelligence. Uh, and it will be a very interactive, uh, experiential uh, type of workshop. So that's a one day workshop followed by a online session a few weeks later. So we can talk about what did you learn and how have you put some of that learning into place. The level two program is a two day program and it's running for the first time on the 26th and 27th of July at the Tradewinds Hotel in Fremantle. And again, you should go to, our, go to the ISA uh, website, eisa.org.au uh, and you can find details. Um, uh, it'll be smaller numbers, uh, working in small groups of people. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to do the uh, Mesquite, which is one of the most popular and um, well-validated uh, EI uh, measurement tools. You'll get your own report. You'll get, you have a lot of time to reflect on your own scores and what they mean in your personal and professional life. We'll go really in depth into the ability model of emotional intelligence and how to improve your EI abilities in your personal and professional life. And then we really think that we'll spend the second day of the program talking about how to improve the EI of the team that you work in and how to embed emotional intelligence into your leadership and uh, management roles. Very quickly, the, the level three program is a specialist program and it's a mentoring program that uh, takes place for approximately one year. Uh, so if you decide to sign up to this program, you're, you would be allocated a mentor, which could be uh, Chris and I, it could be Cindy and uh, Laurel, it could be some members from the International Society. We will try and mentor you up with someone who's really uh, links to your areas of interest. And over that year, we'll meet online or face-to-face -face if we can. Uh, and we will, um, you'll work on projects uh, that are really, really um, important to you in your personal or professional life, and we'll help you work through that uh, project. So look, I'm uh, really excited, really excited for the growth of uh, the Emotional Intelligence Society. Please spread the word, and uh, I'll hand on to um, Associate Professor Annette Watkins. Thank you. Hello, and lovely to see you all. Thank you, Nigel. Um, 
so just as a quick way of introduction, um, I have a business background um, in corporate. And so we are a really diverse group. And I think that's the beauty of ESA is that we are diverse. Um, not only are we in the health pr profession, um, but also a range of other professions. And to be honest, um, we are eclectic. And I think I've found my tribe because it has been a really great sense of belonging. Um, and for me, um, EI, emotional intelligence, um, has been really important professionally because it helps us make good decisions. And in business, we need to make good decisions. It's the way we respond to our staff um, so we can keep them. It's the way that we respond to ideas so we're constantly innovating. Um, it's the way that we um, also engage with our customers so they come back um, over and over again. Um, the, the work that's happening in this space for business such, in, such as leadership, um, which cuts across you know, all of organisations, but also um, reports like Deloitte who talk about automation and AI and it, it can be quite fearful. But what was great out of that report a couple of years ago is that yes, jobs that we do with our hands will be automated largely. Those jobs that we do with our head and the thinking can be um, drawn upon, draw upon AI, but it's the jobs that we do with our heart are the ones that can't be automated or rely upon AI. Um, and so emotional intelligence um, has this real applicability to the future of work, which I think is an exciting piece. So one thing that um, I'd like to talk about is another offering of ESA. Uh, we've heard that we have conferences that we're right, um, what that we will be um, running um, one at the end of the year um, and also our international connections. We've heard from Nigel about our training, but we'll also have research output um, and not just research within an academic setting, research that's applied that we can be using in our workplaces um, now, but also research that our students can be part of also. And we'll hear about how we involve students too in a moment. So I'd really encourage you, if you have some research ideas to connect with us, um, because we have an international um, connection, as we heard from Nigel, and um, um, access to some amazing people, including um, Mark and Neil, who are online today, but many others that we've connected with, um, with um, our exposure to, for instance, the EI Congress a couple of years ago. So I would like to now hand over to Laurel, who will um, speak a little bit more about some of our offerings. Thank you, Laurel. Laurel, Sorry. you're on mute. Sorry, Laurel, we can't hear you. Thanks, Annette. Hi, so I'm Laurel Collin, and I um, belong to the tribe that, that, you know, and it's just been so exciting and and fulfilling to be able to get to this point, you know, all the things that you feel passionate about to have an avenue to pour it out in is just brilliant. So I work at Notre Dame in the School of Nursing and Midwifery. I see undergraduate and postgraduate students academically, but I also see the undergraduates for PRAC. My PhD was in the enhancement of emotion intelligence in undergraduate students. Um, and I also did some tool design. So why am I passionate? Well, when I was working on the wards, I was finding that nurses were becoming more task focused because of the workload and, and other stuff that was going on out there. And the connection with the patient was, was such that the space between the nurse and the patient has been widening. So when I moved into education, I thought, how do we make a more present bedside nurse? And so first of all, I thought everyone talks about critical thinking, but it takes a while to develop that. And we needed something for that new um, student. And so I looked at the building blocks of critical thinking and there was emotional intelligence an ability that we all have the potential to grow um, with the right education. And to, so I you know, had these students and I matched strategies with the Mayor and Salovi model and I found that, you know, I engaged the students more quickly. They had this, they could then create a sense of belonging and feel success and were inspired to continue what they were doing. But it wasn't just that, it was the staff at the facilities would say, we love your students. They just creating these relationships with the patients very quickly and they're being part of the group. So as an educator, I just continually get excited and rewarded for the input that I put into the students. 
from a professional point of view, you know, if you look at the literature and what's going on in the health profession and in nursing and in a lot of other professions, you know, from different perspectives, you know, the student, the postgraduate, the mentor, you can see that we've got these ever increasing layers of stress that are coming that are creating burnout. The, you know, the patient, the nurse patient relationship is beginning to weaken and we're getting this compassion fatigue, which, you know, has been described as, you know, an emotional response culminating in decreased feelings to others, which you can imagine, you know, has a great effect in the workplace. So, um, so people are leaving the profession, which means that we have less experienced mentors and, you know, and the a profession can be viewed as not desirable. You don't want your staff going home crying at the end of every shift, which I get reports from all the time, especially new grads. So we need to, you know, do something. And so what does EI have to offer? Well, if you look at self-awareness, you know, to be able to understand complex feelings and then that self-regulation of being able to detach or engage to the right feeling means that with this emotional regulation, you're going to have a, a higher chance of coping. And this is what I do. Like I'll have students who will just start their first prac. And in the first 48 hours, if I can go and see them and I can say, how did you feel before you came to prac? How are you feeling now? And they identify um, and they match their achievements and their feelings with positive emotions. And they start to think creatively about, well, what do I want to do? And what strategies do I need? You know, what emotional regulation do I need so that I can overcome these barriers, you know, in the future or in the next week or so? So that they start feeling like they belong in that place of work and they can speak up for themselves and they have this effective engagement. In regards to experienced nurses, can you imagine having a staff member who kind of with their EI training can, you know, kind of view the patient's world the way they see their world so that, you know, your the patient feels listened to and that level of trust is built up. And from, you know, an experienced nurse mentor who's focused on the student and can tune in to how they're feeling and in a timely manner help them to regulate their emotions. You know, this would be anybody starting a job, any new person, you know, the enhanced job satisfaction, the change in the ward culture or the work culture and the patient outcomes. I know it's not simple and change takes effort and it takes time. And so, you know, I do notice that there's an optimum time when, you know, there's this heightened awareness of a need for action within a person. And then when you present it, then they're just so happy and they take it on board. The, uh, the last thing I'd like to chat about is ESA webinars. Um, membership to the society gives you free access to our regular webinars they're going to be diverse and they're going to come from, you know, EI from many perspectives. And as we've said before, you know, we've got a, a body of knowledge out there, you know, internationally and from Australia and, you know, kind of, so if we can present to you the latest research and the application of EI um, in an interactive way. And so they'll be advertised on our website and in our newsletters. So look, I look forward to meeting some of you people, you know, maybe at training or on a webinar or at one of our conferences. It would be a real privilege to meet you. And I hope that you kind of get to know more about the organisation and talk about it with other people. And thank you, Cindy, back to you. Thanks, Laurel. Thanks to all our board members. It really is such a privilege to be associated with professionals who are so passionate about EI. And as you've heard from each of our board members, um, emotional intelligence is an essential skill that spans across all professions. And it certainly is something that um, it, you know, enhances business skills as well as our ability personally to relate to people. Hopefully what you heard from each of the board members as well is some of the offerings that ESA will be um, offering to members and you know, things like our conferences, the training that we're gonna be offering, the research opportunities and the webinars. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to one of our ambassadors who has kindly joined us all the way from Seattle. 
Um, so I'll now hand over to Mark Sparvell, who is the Director of Marketing Education at Microsoft. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And shockingly, there's no American accent to go with my Seattle base. So that's, that's, that's probably a good thing. I've been living here in, uh, in um, Washington State now for eight years. I was back in Australia for three months to uh, top up both my accent and renew my passion for pasties, pies, sausage rolls, lamingtons and bunnings sausages, all of which are not available here and I miss them dearly. Um, Thank you, Cindy, for that. My jam is around education. If we're not following one another on Twitter, if you want to consider this to be an introduction and an invitation to follow up with me, I popped my handle in the, uh, the chat pane, so feel free um, to reach out. Education is, is my jam, as I said. It's that profession that shapes every other profession. And schools, when people ask me about their purpose, schools are the places where society is created and recreated. They're the places where we shape our preferred futures. And I constantly argue with people about fixed future mentality. Uh, certainly 2020 showed us it's very difficult to predict the future. I've worked in education my entire career, um, which is around about 30, 35 years now, in roles from classroom teaching to deputy principal to principal roles in rural schools, in urban schools. I've been regional leaders, state and national coordinator of values education projects for the federal government. I've been a very sloppy lecturer. That's a shame. I'd love to be employed by uh, Notre Dame one day. I still have the drink bottle from a number of years ago, but a sloppy lecturer both at universities in Australia and also here in the United States. I guess you would say I have this passion for exploring the intersection between best practice and next practice when it comes to education and matching the other strand of DNA there is around what's the role of technology here? How can technology humanize the learning process and not just digitize the curriculum content? How can the thoughtful use of technology allow education to listen at scale, to respond at scale, and importantly, to give every student voice and choice and agency to actually make a difference and to take action? Eventually, the work that I was doing with Principals Australia Institute and my work in education led me to being lured over here to work with, uh, with Microsoft, where I'm situated within the education team, and I've been leading education projects across the globe, working directly with ministries of education, districts, schools in most countries around the world on transformation topics, and not just digital transformation, but the sort of the cultural transformation and I brought with me, if you like, this kind of interest in the role that emotion plays as a gatekeeper to cognition, to motivation and attention, that you can't pursue an agenda around a transformation without recognising it's not a digital transformation, it's a human transformation. And that if we want to improve learning and learner outcomes, we must pay careful attention to the social and emotional dimension. Now, this has seen us as a company double down on research in the area of emotional intelligence, partnering with groups like the Economist Intelligence Unit to publish Emotion, Cognition in the Age of AI, which examined how social and emotional learning was fundamental and not ornamental, both as an input and an output for high-performing school systems across the globe. We worked with McKinsey and Company's Global Practice to publish the Class of 2030 and Life Ready Learning, which was radical because we weren't talking about university ready or career ready, but we were suggesting that there was a broader agenda here about civic participation, about contribution to civil society, and that that came with dispositions and skills and not just scores on a card. Class of 2030 and Life Ready Learning also took an industry scan at what might the jobs in the future look like, both the jobs that will be transformed 
the jobs that will be lost and the jobs that will be created. And as a previous speaker also noted, between 30 and 50% of future growth jobs, net new jobs, will place a premium on the skills that make us uniquely human. The skills which can't be replicated or easily automated by, by AI or by automation technologies. So why is this so important right now? Um, this ability to read, to understand, and to respond to emotions both in ourselves and others, it's crucial to predicting our health, to predict our happiness, and also our personal and our professional success. And certainly, 2020 and education across the globe showed us, as I mentioned, the future is very, very hard to predict and to plan for when we seek to best prepare young people for a future. 1.6 billion students had their formal education interrupted across the globe. In the US, most students right now are still not at school. I have not been to my office since November 2019, just to give you a sense of what's happening here. One of the things we know is that this blast zone of 2020, this humanitarian, this economic and this public health crisis will ripple out across the next three to five years based on other sort of global uh, sort of economic, but also health and environmental catastrophes. But the impacts won't be felt by all individuals and groups the same. An intentional and not accidental, an intentional approach and focus on developing emotional intelligence of leaders, of teachers and students, that ability to recognize, understand, accurately label, express and regulate emotions can help ameliorate the negative consequences of being exposed to uncertainty, ambiguity and stress. But importantly, it can also maximize learner achievement, their participation, their contribution and their subjective well-being. So this is not about, let's just uh, take a, you know, deal with the, the negative side and ameliorate. There are many pro-social lifelong benefits, as you all know. Now, take action, action, taking action matters. Um, talking is great. Advocacy is great. But taking action matters. After a, a session with Salzburg Global Seminar on the assessment of social and emotional skills a couple of years ago, I founded a community called the Cell in Edu community as a direct action, social and emotional learning and education. It's a global collective on Facebook that shares practice ideas, research, and also association information. We have 11,000 members. It just keeps on growing. That's the degree of interest. For me, it gives me a Petri dish of the globe of practitioners, researchers, parents, people who are interested in this topic. As I mentioned in my probably bio, I advise for Goldie Horn's Mind Up Foundation. They've been running 17 years promoting mindfulness as um, you know, a direct strategy to support learner well-being. Um, and I also continue and carry through this work with Salzburg and Karanga, the Global Cell Collective. So what I'm hoping to do, and I'm delighted to do, is to bring to this newly found society this global perspective uh, from an Australian drifting around the planet, working with ministries and educators and higher education institutions across the globe, those insights from a global perspective, particularly around the role that technology can play. And I'm not going to be trying to sell anybody, excuse the pun, on Microsoft, so you don't need to worry, it's not a commercial break. Um, even though shamelessly behind me is a tool that I'm very proud of, but I won't even bore you with that. What I'd like to do just in closing, is to, to thank you sincerely for the honor of being an ambassador for this newly found society. Good news should always travel fast and it's organizations like this that can help accelerate the conversation, can amplify the voices and importantly, as we've heard already from others, connect the innovators and connect the outliers so that they don't feel that they're a lone voice, that they do feel they're connected. 
at the end of the day, you know, our big bold aim is that students feel calm, they feel confident, and they feel connected, that they have voice and choice and agency to take control and make a difference. Because we know the brain doesn't mind stress, but it hates feeling out of control. I look forward to our ongoing shared work together and delighted to make everyone's acquaintance. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. You can see your passion coming through in education and um, how it sort of interlinks as well with technology. But I think um, some of the things that you mentioned there with regards to um, you know, early intervention and teaching the skills of social and emotional intelligence in schools and with educators, especially now considering the world that we live in. I certainly know from a number of my supervisees who work in schools, the um, state of dysregulation and the heightened uh, state of emotional arousal of children presenting in schools on a day-to-day -day basis has kind of gone through the roof exponentially. And the more we can find those interventions and ways of alleviating that emotional distress in the education system, the more likely we are to be able to help them address their sort of cognitive um, learning in that space. So I think it's such a critical part of the emotional intelligence dissemination, you know, throughout society. So thank you for all the work that you do. And again, we just so appreciate you being part of our society. Thank you. It now is my um, honor to introduce you to our next ambassador, Professor Neil Ashkenazi, who's a professor, professor of management in the UQ Business School at the University of Queensland. Neil, thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, so uh, thanks very much, uh, Cindy. Uh, my name is Neil Ashkenazi. I just attempted to send a comment there of some details about myself, but all I came up with was a stupid thing from Google. So forget about that post that I just uh, just sent uh, sent out there. Uh, so uh, I am a uh, professor at the University of uh, Queensland. I've been here for uh, for many years now. Uh, I uh, I get to retire at the end of next year, although I'm not sure I'll. I'll necessarily be, be out of the out of, out of the frame of action uh, when that happens. Um, I, I live in Brisbane, uh, which is a tourable and Jagarai country. Uh, most of you, uh, although you don't know it, have heard of the Jagarai people because their word uh, for hard work is yakka. And uh, you've all heard of uh, doing hard yakka or even the uh, the uh, range of uh, work clothes and the yakka. So that's the uh, the Jagarai people. And behind me is a uh, lovely image by two ladies of the Kundamuga people, which is the uh, country of the uh, of Morton Island. And I'll duck out of the road. <laughs> and what you see there is the Brisbane River winding through the um, through the landscape. And uh, over on this side, you've got the uh, the uh, inland of Australia and over this side you've got the seaside. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely, uh, lovely image and um, it's uh, great to have an image like that behind us because I think it represents a, uh, a, a, a spiritual intelligence which sits at a higher level still uh, from emotional intelligence. So, so my background uh, was originally my, my first occupation was as a ginger beer. And if you're good on your rhyming slang, you will know that a ginger beer is an engineer. Uh, and I worked in water resources engineering. Most of you know about the flood of um, in Brisbane of 2011. Uh, well, I was the dude who ran the, who led the team that developed the famous floodgates that uh, worked so well, so well, but have been the subject of so much uh, criticism. So for 20 years, uh, I engaged in um, I engaged in uh, my engineering activities. I think um, I, I found it an enjoyable career, but there were some problems. So the engineer was good, uh, but the people doing the engineer were star 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 ed in the head. And uh, I decided, well, what's going on here that I'm working in this organization uh, that seems to be so badly managed? Uh, well, I was lucky because uh, at that time uh, we had um, Edward Gough Whitlam became uh, our prime minister. And uh, Edward said, uh, tertiary education is free, my friends. Uh, so I thought, ah, right, here we go. Uh, jumped into part-time education, and at the end of it, I came out as uh, as a with a, with a PhD in uh, in psychology, and uh, believe it or not, that's right, that's what my PhD is in. And uh, uh, my my field was leadership, 
and uh, I, I, I was, um, I, I studied attribution theory and leadership. I wanted to find out what are the cognitive me mechanisms uh, underlying uh, leadership, um, because that was what was wrong in the organization I worked for. In fact, all my research is really driven by my experiences in my engineering career. Uh, so it was leadership, cognitive models of leadership, cognitive models, no, not working, no, not, not, not quite there. Um, then, uh, then I turned to organizational culture. And if you look at my, uh, my uh, credentials and CV, you see that I've been quite prominent at the area with two handbooks of organizational uh, culture and climate that I, I published and was cruising along there all right till I went on a sabbatical uh, in Canada, the University of Calgary. And uh, we had a speaker over and his name was Peter Frost. Uh, from the University of uh, British Columbia. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Peter is no longer uh, with us now. He passed away uh, before his time, unfortunately. But uh, Peter uh, certainly had an impression on me because he said, uh, hey, what about emotions? Uh, should we be looking at the role of emotions in, uh, in, in, in organizations? And uh, this sort of, oh, okay, here we got something um, interesting. So I began to network around the place and didn't take long uh, at that stage for me to make contact uh, with the uh, with the leading uh, players in emotional intelligence. People like uh, Peter Selvey, uh, Jack Mayer, Dan Goldman, uh, and 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 all of those people who are at the uh, who are at the leading edge of the um, of the emotional uh, emotions in organisation, which was broader, and then bring in emotional intelligence. So I quickly realised that emotional intelligence was something. Uh, that uh, that we needed to pay attention to. Uh, I am a little bit of a devotee of uh, the uh, Salovey and Mayer model, and uh, I've actually been uh, quite critical of some of the other uh, models of emotional intelligence that some of you would have heard of, the, uh, the trait emotional intelligence uh, or the Baron model. Uh, and people say, oh, Ashkenazi hates that sort of stuff. Um, uh, don't talk to him about it. But if you look at my publications, especially some of the recent ones that I've done uh, with my colleague uh, Azadeh Rezvani, you'll see that I've actually been using those, those, uh, those other models. Um, um, but I've been fighting the good fight for emotional intelligence in the, um, in the uh, organizational uh, studies area, the organizational behavior area. And I've got some advice for any of you who are aspiring scholars. If you want to make a career in, um, in organizational behavior, organizational studies, stay away from emotional intelligence. <laughs> Many of our colleagues hate it. Uh, they think that, uh, in fact, I've got a colleague, a very well-known colleague whose name is, uh, is John uh, Antonakis. Um, and, and John combines uh, his heritage, his Greek heritage, uh, with his education in the USA and his current location in Switzerland uh, to be a very, very assertive uh, individual. And uh, he says, uh, emotional intelligence is BS. Uh, it's just a branch of G, you know, G, the general general intelligence, um, intelligence, emotional intelligence, all the same thing, uh, according to him. And uh, if you if you look up uh, the leadership quarterly and uh, a debate paper that I wrote uh, with um, with my uh, former PhD student um, Marie Despera. Uh, so we've got uh, Antonakis, Ashkenazi and Despera, uh, 2009 Leadership Quarterly, uh, is emotional intelligence important for leadership? And John says no, Marie and I say uh, yes. And uh, the, the, um, the, 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 so the debate goes on. And in fact, Leadership Quarterly is just about to publish a, uh, a, a follow-up debate. Um, it's it's a rather long paper. In fact, it's a real uh, Megillah to use the Yiddish term for a um, for a, a, a long story. Uh, but it'll be coming out uh, probably later this year. So uh, if you if you're uh, able to access uh, Leadership Quarterly, um, uh, please have a look at that uh, article that I, I, I brought on board on board my colleague uh, Ron Humphrey to argue the emotional intelligence case. Um, some of you would have already known uh, Ron because of his amazing uh, research, but also the work that he's done with emotional uh, labour. And we uh, debate with uh, other colleagues, um, uh, not John this time, he's the editor of uh, Leadership Quarterly, but we debate with other colleagues about the importance. And uh, if you read that, hey guys, we lay them in the aisle. So, uh, <laughs> well, I think we do anyway. And I, I'm not biased as well. Um, 
Uh, it's like my attitude to the Brisbane Lions football club. Um, uh, those umpires are always against this, right? So no bias. Uh, but uh, I passionately believe uh, in emotional intelligence and with good reason too, uh, because I worked in an organization where um, my colleagues had no emotional intelligence. Believe me, these guys had nothing. And they were guys, by the way, uh, in those days, no emotional intelligence. And the organization um, uh, bumbled on until eventually it went into a crash dive and uh, and, uh, and and died and uh, probably good riddance, although I think that we probably did a few good engineering projects in the meantime. So I'm not going to bore you. I'll look at the time. I've got to 11.19 in your time, which is uh, past now. So it's given you a bit of an idea for where I'm coming, coming from uh, with emotional intelligence. I wish the uh, society all the best. Uh, it's a great message to, to get out there and let's see if we can um, uh, bring in uh, more uh, colleagues, uh, not only from academia, but from the uh, from the uh, practical uh, and consulting and industrial uh, fields of uh, professional work uh, to make this a, um, a really important movement and association. So good luck, everybody. Thank you so much, Neil. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you for agreeing to be one of our ambassadors. Um, and I, I must congratulate you on fighting such a long fight and flying the flag for emotional intelligence in leadership and management for such a long time. And um, hearing that you're retiring, I hope that means that you'll have uh, more time to collaborate with us in the coming months and years in our newly formed society. But thank you very much for your contributions. And as I said again, you know, to have ambassadors like Mark and Neil join our society is really such a privilege. And we're so looking forward to collaborating with you more as the, as the society grows over the coming years. Um, we were actually going to have John Pelletieri joining us, but as Chris mentioned, he's unfortunately unwell. So I'm going to hand back to uh, Chris Skinner just for a few minutes for him to just close in some parting words, and then I will um, come back and open up for some questioning before we finish up. So, Chris, over to you for a few words. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Cindy. Um, I've just been really impressed, and it's really exciting just hearing the range over the last 45 minutes, both from the group itself and both from, both from Mark and Neil's perspectives. Um, I think it really, 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 really bids well for our growth and development. And hopefully the people who are at the launch can see that growth and see that potential. It was interesting on many levels, both what Mark and Neil said. I actually met Peter Frost. The toxic, uh, the toxic uh, reference was really interesting. And uh, certainly the energy that one gets to go into emotional intelligence from a positive view, but also from your negative experiences leading you to want to be positive in an organizational context is actually, I can share a lot of, a lot of that. Um, John Pelletieri, who is in New York, as I said, um, really did um, start the whole international society process in a sense going. And um, it's a pity he's not with us, but as I said, he really sends his regards. So I think now, Cindy, I, I think it's been a really useful um, launch, a really good one. And I think we're now ready probably to do some questions and answers. So back to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, for those of you who uh, need to leave the webinar for any reason before we go into questioning, please don't forget to sign up and become a member. We do have um, scholarships available for student members. And don't forget to follow us on social media to keep up to date with um, the offerings that we'll have with regards to training and conferences and any webinars. Um, I would just like to thank, in case anyone is leaving, to thank you very much for joining us today. We've really appreciated you coming online with us. And to once again thank our ambassadors, and I would like to thank all my fellow board members for their contributions. I'm actually going to hand over to Annette, who has kindly been correlating questions coming in. So, um, Annette, I'll hand over to you if there's any specific questions that have come through that maybe can be addressed by either some of the board members or our ambassadors. Indeed. Um, I think maybe this might be one uh, for Mark. Um, there was a couple of questions that came to me around uh, teenagers and how important um, emotional intelligence is um, for teenagers. Um, so they were just keen to hear a little bit more about that work, if you had anything else to add. Sorry to put you on the spot, Mark. 
Oh, that's fine. I, I spend my life being put on the spot, so that's quite <laughs> yeah. fine. You know, one of the things that's really interesting, certainly in the last, uh, you know, over the last year, has been, you know, as people shifted to remote work globally and learners shifted to remote learning in various forms, everybody was being treated almost like they were the same, that this kind of paradigm shift for young people was the same as for adults. But increasingly what we're sort of hearing about is how is this different for the developing brain? You know, the, the, the brain of the very young, so in early years, and then also the developing brain, the teenage brain. How has this experience impacted them now and into the future? And what we did, and I think this was kind of like an interesting example of that sort of outside in perspective, was we went out and talked to a developmental molecular biologist to ask a person who only believes what it is they can measure What's going on in the brains of teenagers? What are the, some of the practical things? Don't, don't give us moonshots. What's something on Monday or Tuesday that might help a teacher who's trying to gear up for you know, a lesson? And this developmental molecular biologist had these fascinating strategies for teenagers. One was he, he called it, he called it uh, being careful of big head syndrome. And uh, when I asked him what that meant, he meant that, well, you're never this close to people in real life. If you're that close to, in somebody's personal zone, you're either going to fight them or mate with them. You know, biologically, that's what your brain is trying to decide between. And having your teacher, you know, in your face like that all day, your brain isn't fatigued at the end of the day, having Zoom fatigue with a bright light. It's having cognitive overload trying to reconcile you know a biological response and then the logical response to this listening to people like social anthropologists and going out and you know i mean this is microsoft on microsoft funding me to do this crazy work going out to talk to social anthropologists or actually i had harvard business review go out and talk to them but fired them up with questions around how for young people teenagers who we know are moving through this kind of norm referencing stage and are seeking identity, shared identity, co-regulation, co what's this doing to them? And what might, be, what might be the negative consequences? What might be the strategies that might ameliorate some of those negative consequences? So um, really interesting. I'll share a link to the paper. It's out there for free. Again, it doesn't try to sell Surface or Office, even though they're far superior products to our competitors. That's a joke. Um, but I'm happy to share out that research because it's interesting when you take an outside in perspective around the topic, especially around the topic of the developing brain and the impact of stress, trauma and anxiety on it uh, from all these different lenses, it just provides some really interesting kind of um, background data for teachers to make interventions decisions on. Thank you, Mark. That's, I really love some of those images like big head syndrome. I'm going to remember that one. Have we got time for one more question, Cindy? Excellent. We've got one for, for Neil. Um, I don't know if you've spotted that one, Neil, in the chat. Um, so Clara's really keen to understand overcoming resistance to acknowledge emotional intelligence in you know, these engineering dominant um, businesses. Um, What's, have you got any tips for Clara? Well, the, the ultimate uh, test is, uh, is going to be the empirical results um, demonstrating that emotional intelligence actually works. Uh, sure, uh, providing uh, objective data uh, can be a little bit um, contentious when people have a particular um, mindset. I'm, I'm never going to agree that those umpires are, uh, are on our side. <laughs> um, but uh, ultimately, uh, if you just keep putting the data uh, in front of people and validate and can show that it's valid data, uh, the, the, um, that's the only way to overcome, overcome resistance. And you've got to present it in a way that is, uh, that is convincing and maybe have the emotional intelligence to, uh, to break through uh, those biases and resistance that people have. 
Thank you, Neil. So that was really the themes that were coming through, Cindy, in, in the questions. Back to you. Thanks, Annette. Thanks very much, Mark and Neil, for answering those questions from our participants. And if any of you participants have um, further questions and would like to contact any of us, please just go onto our website and fill in one of our contact forms and somebody will definitely get back to you on anything that you might have missed in the webinar. As I mentioned before, the webinar has been recorded. So if there are um, other people you know who may be interested in joining our society, we will be posting a link to this launch on our social media which means that you can direct people to it and hopefully they can find out more about our society and increase the numbers. Thank you all very much. The meeting will now close officially. If I could just ask our board members to stay online, that would be great. To everyone else, thank you. Thanks, Mark, Neil. See you all. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.